Hi everyone. This video is titled, Is Zero a Natural Number? Now, that sounds like a weird question. Um, surely mathematicians agree on what the set of real numbers is. Uh, so what we're going to do in this video is first talk about why that question even makes sense to ask, and then we'll spend a few minutes talking about why I prefer one of the answers to this question as opposed to the other. Now, if you are an American high school student or an American undergraduate, chances are when I ask, is zero a natural number, you say no, because in your mind, the set of natural numbers is the set containing one, two, three, four, five, and so on. However, if you learned your mathematics outside of the United States, or if you've had some exposure to graduate level math, you may prefer the second definition. And if I ask, is zero a natural number? You say, sure, the natural numbers is uh, the set containing zero, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Now, this is a legitimate question to ask. Um, at the end of the day, though, there's not a right answer, and you need to use whatever definition your textbook or your teacher does. Uh, there's no reason to get argumentative or get a bad grade over, over something like this. You can link them to this YouTube video. Now, this book, this is... Uh, uh, the book that I used in my undergraduate uh, real analysis class uses the first definition for the set of natural numbers. It um, says that the set of natural numbers is the set containing one, two, three, four, five, and so on. On the other hand, this graduate level abstract algebra book says that the set of natural numbers is the set containing zero, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. So, two math books, both used at universities, um, use two different definitions for the set of natural numbers, and it's not that one book is correct and the other is wrong. Now, if you are used to the first definition, which I'm going to assume most of the people watching this video are, then your textbook will go on and define something called the set of whole numbers, sometimes uh, denoted with a capital W. If you are used to the second definition for the set of natural numbers, then there's obviously no need to define the set of whole numbers because it's just redundant, it's the same thing. In either case though, what's gonna happen after this is we'll define the set of integers um, which contain zero, the positive whole numbers, the negative whole numbers. Um, so at the end of the day, we get, we get the same set of integers that we're used to, and then we can go on and define the rationals and the reals and the complex numbers and all of that, uh, all of that wonderful stuff. Now for me, I prefer uh, the second definition, and I'm going to spend the rest of the video talking about why I prefer the second definition. To really understand it, though, you have to understand a little bit of set theory. Uh, this is a graduate level set theory book by Herbert Enderton, and it has a really, really, really good um, discussion on the construction of the real number system. The guest commentators that you might hear in the background are my wife's four brand new parakeets. They're lovely birds, but they don't respect when people are trying to make YouTube videos. So on to set theory and the set of natural numbers. Now, in set theory, we talk about these weird symbols to make sets like this. But one of the fundamental axioms of set theory, one of the axioms that you have to, that you have to start with, is the empty set axiom. And it just says that the empty set exists. Now the empty set, you see curly brace on the left, curly brace on the right, and there's nothing inside. That's why it's called the empty set. It's a container that doesn't have anything in it. In most math classes, the empty set will be noted with this uh, slightly off uh, lowercase Greek phi. Now, if you ask yourself how many elements are inside the empty set, you say, well, zero. It doesn't have anything in it. So since it has zero elements, why not call the empty set zero? And this is kind of what actually happens. In, uh, in set theory. Now, one of the other axioms of set theory, and I'm not going to go into all the details because it gets a little complicated, lets you build new sets from old ones. So we have the empty set. We can construct a set, curly brace on the left, curly brace on the right, that contains the empty set as an element. Now, to make it less confusing, since we already said we're going to use the number zero for the empty set, I could rewrite this as 
the set that contains the number zero. And now ask yourself the question, how many elements are in this set? Well, there's one element in this set, namely the number zero. So let's call that set the number one. And now we're going to do the same thing again. One of the axioms of set theory will let us build a new set. This set, curly brace on the left, curly brace at the far right, contains the empty set and the set containing the empty set, which again, the, the notation gets a little bit confusing if you haven't done much set theory, so we can simplify it. We're going to build a set that contains the number zero, that's the empty set, and it contains the number one. So we have the set containing zero and one. And ask yourself the question, how many elements does this set have? Well, it has two elements. So let's call this set the number two. What we're doing here is we're using a mathematical operation called the successor operation. I won't go into details, but if you want to Google the phrase successor operation, you'll see a lot more details about it. Now over here, this looks even more confusing, so I'm not even going to try to digest that. What you do, though, is you build the set that contains the number 0, the number 1, and the number 2. And then ask yourself the question, how many elements are in this set? And obviously, there are three elements in that set. And you continue in this way. So I'm not even going to think about what the set theory notation would look like. It would be really ugly. But we're going to construct the set that contains the number 0, 1, 2, and 3. So this set contains all of the, all of the numbers we've built so far. And then I say, well, how many numbers are in that set? There are four. And you can keep going. The next thing we would do is construct the set containing 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And that set would have five elements, and that becomes the number 5. So starting from the axioms of set theory, namely the empty set axiom, which can guarantees us that the empty set exists, and then some of the other axioms that let us build these new sets. And you do need one more axiom. It's called the axiom of infinity or the inductive axiom, depending on what book you look at. That will guarantee us that all of these natural numbers exist. And that's why I prefer the second definition, where 0 is a natural number, because this is a very natural starting point for this uh, process that lets us build our number system. And then once you get the natural numbers, you can use set theory again, you can build the integers, you can build the rationals, you can build the real numbers and the complex numbers. And it's all really interesting. But anyway, that's why I prefer having zero as a natural number. If you ask me what the set of natural numbers is, well, I'll say it's the set containing zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. Uh, once again, there's not a right answer or a wrong answer to this question. Uh, when you're doing your homework, use whatever your textbook says. Uh, it's not that big a deal. But I thought you might find it interesting. So that's the end of this video. You can hear the birds say it's the end of this video. Uh, see you next time.